are on the renal corpuscle and we'll take you through the nephron. As you can see from this picture, the renal corpuscle The renal corpuscle is the Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus inside. So let's talk about the Bowman's capsule because it's double layered. It's not a single layered capsule. The Bowman's capsule, as you can see here, I have one and two. One is a parietal layer, two is considered a visceral layer. <coughs> so the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule, it, it's basically, as you can see, a, a simple squamous epithelial tissue. It, it's the capsule function. It's, it's kept catching all of the filtrate. <clears throat> Capsule function. Now that visceral layer it, it's not a regular epithelium. Those cells are specialized. They're called podocytes. And they have foot processes that help perform the filtration function. So the visceral layer composed of podocyte cells, pod means foot, podocyte cells. So these cells have foot processes that wrap around glomerular capillaries. <coughs> have foot processes wrap around glomerular capillaries. So that's basically all you can see from this picture. Know the two layers of Bowman's capsule, parietal and visceral. <clears throat> if you cut open the Bowman's capsule, if you cut open the renal corpuscle, you can see how the glomerular capillaries are situated inside the capsule. And it's still the same one too, parietal, visceral layers um, of the Bowman's capsule. And you can even see the red blood cells circulate through the glomerular capillaries. And so, look at the direction arrows, arrow here, blood coming in. Now, if blood's coming in, is it afferent or efferent? Afferent. Efferent going out, afferent going in. Okay. Huh. All right, well, let's see. What else can you see from this picture? Well, if this is the middle corpuscle, what if I asked you to identify here? What would you say? The first part after is PCT. Okay, that is an acceptable abbreviation. PCT. So then we have the terms vascular pole, tubular pole. Basically consider both sides. 
as being polar opposites. So in Bowman's capsule, when they say number one, vascular pole, vascular pole, is basically the side that has the blood vessels on it. The afferent and the efferent arterial are on the same side. What you also see at the vascular pole is a portion of the DCT. It's always there. That's DCT. <clears throat> DCT. So on the side opposite where I have number two, that's called the tubular pole, the first part of the PCT after the Bowman's capsule. <coughs> PCT. It's collecting all the filtrate. The capsule collects it all and it proceeds to the proximal convoluted tubule after you filtrate. And um, the poles are really useful. And um, it's unusual to have a vascular pole. It's unusual to have an arterial capillary arterial arrangement. That's unusual. What's also unusual is that they're both on the same side. I mean, usually how blood flows is like a stream. It's like an arterial, then a capillary, then a vein on the other side. But they put both blood vessels on one side and then a tube on the other. So that it, it's a good filter. All the stuff that is filtered makes it out here. And whatever doesn't make it through the filter <coughs> is in the efferent arterial. And you know where that goes next, right? It goes to one of those other two capillary beds, the PT or the vasorectum. So I put a couple of slides here to, to let you practice the whole pole thing, vascular or tubular. Because if you can do that, it's easy to navigate through the nephron. For example. Because the nephron's confusing to look at, it's squiggly too. But if you can find that, and you can identify a vascular pole on that side, and then tubular pole on the other, follow the tube. PCT, which keeps going, and then loop of Henley. The loop of Henley always turns back on itself. Then you get here, now it's DCT. And the DCT always goes by um, the vascular pole. Okay? And you can see it go by there, and then DCT on the way out. So you really have to pay close attention to where those poles are. Because when I have you identify different parts of the nephron, you can get it all mixed up. For example, do it again. If you see your corpuscle, what side is that one? Vascular or tubular? This is vascular, so that's tubular. So I know that's the PCT, and you just follow that convoluted tube all the way down. Uh, it goes down there, and then it turns back, and now this is gonna be uh, sort of the DCT there, and it goes back there, by the vascular pole, this is DCT, then it dumps into the collecting duct. So once you get these straightened out, you're less likely to, to be confused. For example, if you practice with a blank one, or if you practice with this model here, showing you pyramid cortex, if, you, if I do a close up here, <clears throat> if I identify my glomerulus, that's a vascular pole, that's tubular pole, so that makes this what? P C T. When you get down to here, what do you call it? PDC. Loop of Henle, then D C T. And see how the D C T always goes by that other pole before it dumps into this part here, which is what? Collecting done. So always use the poles as kind of a landmark to kind of figure out where you are. You won't get confused. For example, this one, they show boom vascular pulp. Now, they show two blood vessels here. Which one is this one? The afferent or the efferent? The afferent is the one that's connected to the interlobular artery. So e, that's efferent. So that's vascular pulp. That's tubular pulp. And they color code it. That's PCT. Then loop of Henle. Then DCT always ends up 
phi there, DCT, and it ends up into the white structure, which is the collecting duct. Which capillaries are these red ones here? PT. They go from red to blue right there. What about these down here? Vasa recta. So they're shown on this model here. On this model, we already looked at it. I believe, did we look at this? Yeah, we did. We did. Um, this one, I don't think we looked at. We have this one in the room. Um, it has numbers. Okay, good. What's number one? I would call that... Some students will put glomerulus. I would mark that wrong. You know why? I know it's in there, but I can't see it. I see the Bowman's capsule, or you could call it a renal corpuscle. That would be acceptable. So number two and three. Two, afferent arterial, making three. Efferent arterial, four and five. Four is the DCT. Five is the PCT. Okay. Which is there more of, four or five? There's more PCT, that's true. The PCT are your most active reabsorbers. It's the first part. You have the most to reabsorb there. You just filtered it. By the time you get to DCT, there's not much left. So it goes vascular pole, tubular pole, so all that beige stuff is the PCT, all the way down, loop of Henry, it goes up. The dark purple is the uh, DCT, then it dumps into the yellow uh, collecting duct. Okay. <clears throat> The other things here, seven and eight, can you identify that? Arcuate artery and vein. If that's the arcuate artery and vein, number nine and ten, interlobular artery and vein. Thirteen, it's a straight vessel. Vasorecta. And so you see why it's a straight vessel, and you see why it's a capillary. There's like little branches coming off there and you get the gas exchange from red to blue. And uh, yeah. Identify 14. Paratubular capillary. Okay. So again, the arcuate artery is, is a good landmark. This is all cortex up here. Okay. I think that was everything. Let's move on. Let's label very practice. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we're talking about the renal corpuscle. The main function of the glomerulus is filtration. There's some uh, facts. The filtrate is the filtration of the blood, specifically blood plasma. You don't filter the crit. Okay, those stay in the blood. So it contains all the plasma components except large proteins. Things are secreted into the filtrate, and as I've said before, if they're not reabsorbed, they're excreted. Okay. Urine contains all the waste products that you want it to excrete. They're mostly nitrogenous waste products like creatinine, urea, uric acid, and some other unneeded substances. So what makes the good, what makes the glomerulus a good filter? It's a filtration membrane with those podocytes. Here's a good picture of it. On this picture you see the podocytes wrapping around the capillaries. Here's a close up of that. There's the cell nucleus. And you can see the foot processes, they like interdigitate with other foot processes of other cells. And they make slits, filtration slits. Because these capillaries are very leaky. And you want to limit the leaking. You don't want to filter larger molecules like hormones and other things. You want to filter only small molecules. And so to help um, limit the leakiness, the fenestrations are complemented with these slits by the um, overlapping podocytes. So, I'm just going to add that form filtration slits. So those slits, they kind of um, 
they, they form the filtration membrane with the fenestrations. They limit the fill, they limit the filtration of the fenestrations. So filtration slits, fenestrations. The fenestrations are the holes or the pores in the glomerular capillary. <coughs> All capillaries have fenestrations. These glomerular capillaries are highly fenestrated and with the slits, you filter the right stuff, just the fluid, just the plasma, and the small molecules. If you did a cross-section through the foot processes and the glomerulus, you'd see they're, they're stuck together by a, a basement membrane. So the filtration membrane is actually composed of three things. You have the glomerular capillaries with holes in it, so those endothelial cells are holy. You have these big holes. So this is a um, glomerular capillary in cross section. If you even measured the hole there, it's 70 nanometers in diameter. Now there's a basement membrane, connective tissue, that's filled with proteins, P, R, O, and those proteins are usually negatively charged. P, R, O, negatively charged. It's a connective tissue, basement membrane. And on the other side of that are the processes of a potocyte cell. I'm drawing the whole cell. They just show the foot processes on the picture. I used to be confused by this picture as a student because I used to think each one of these yellow things was an individual cell, but it's not. It's just a process of a single cell. So one cell, but many foot processes. Like there. Protein. Yeah. Connective tissues usually have a lot of proteins and they usually carry a negative charge. And the charge is important because the membrane will determine what can make it through the filter. Because if you're filtering in this direction, you got to make it through this pore, which is a fenestration, <clears throat> which is 70 nanometers. But because of the potocytes, you also have to make it through this slit, which is much smaller. That's a filtration slit. This would measure to be about 14 nanometers. You can see how the slits limit the filtration, which is a good thing. Okay. But it all gets filtered from blood to filtrate. 
filter the blood, blood plasma. What makes it through is the filtrate. This filter, these three things, the glomerular capillary, number one, number two, the basement membrane, number three, the foot process filters, is the filtration membrane, and it filters based upon <coughs> two basic things. One, the size of the molecule. Okay? Remember my analogy I talked about the donation box. So it's going to favor filtration of large or small molecules. Small. Okay? A large molecule might be able to make it through the fenestration, but not the slit. <coughs> Filtered out. So basically favors small molecules. But also charge. Second. So because the basement membrane is filled with negatively charged proteins, it favors the charge of positively charged <coughs> molecules. Now, negative molecules can make it through if they're small enough. I don't want you to think nothing negative ever makes it through. That's not true. But it, fa it would favor a smaller positive molecule if given the choice. So that is that. And um, if you look at if you got look at the previous picture, right? I tried to put them next to each other so it makes sense. If I said identify cell, what would you put? Potocyte. But exactly where it's pointing and I said identify, what would you put? Foot process of the potocyte. Okay? The space in between the foot processes you should call filtration slit. Number two is our basement membrane. Number three is the glomerular capillary. But what is the space called? Fenestration. Okay, it's bigger, smaller. The filtration is through that structure. Here's a real picture. The real picture is way better than the illustration. I'm going to turn the lights out so you can see the detail. If you look at a glomerular capillary from the inside, I mean, look at all those holes. The two many to point to. It's literally covered with fenestrations. Everything would leak out through your kidneys if it weren't for the filtration slits on the other side of those holes. Here's the other side. So there's the, the cell body of the potocyte. Look at the foot processes. Look at those slits. I mean, it's really pretty to look at. It's like the slits are like super well constructed. It's, it's very, very good design. This is a, a perfect filter. Filtering all your blood plasma 70 times a day. Obviously, this is super high mag. Uh, the mag isn't on here. Let's see here. So let's talk about the filtration process. What makes it a good filter? Well, qualitatively, the kidneys, glomerular capillaries, they filter blood plasma just like any other capillary bed. However, quantitatively, the throughput is much more, okay? The glomerular capillaries, they produce 180 liters of filtrate daily, in contrast to just a few liters <coughs> formed by other capillary beds. So the filtration process is you know, extraordinary. And so, again, that's something like filtering all your plasma like 70 times a day. It's a very good filter, the high throughput. Because if the function is excretion, you got to filter, keep on filtering it out. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's talk about numbers here. What are the pressures that push the filtrate into the nephron? This is called determining net filtration pressure.
determining NFP net filtration pressure NFP. Remember, regular blood pressure is 120 over 80, 93 mean arterial pressure. Um, so that regular blood pressure, 93 <coughs> mean arterial pressure, when you get down to the afferent arterial, that pressure is about 55. Yeah. And we call it the hydrostatic pressure. Just that, we called it that before, if you recall. We talked about capillary exchange before. I actually already taught capillary exchange, right? A hydrostatic pressure, colloid osmotic pressure, they kind of work opposite to each other. This is the same <laughs> conversation, except we have to add one additional factor. This capillary bed is wrapped with a capsule. And the capsule is fluid filled. So the fluid in the capsule exerts a pressure that opposes filtration. So we have to add that in. Okay. So HP is hydrostatic pressure. GC, the subscript, is glomerular capsule. Okay, so let's just call it HP. Hydrostatic pressure. 55 millimeters of mercury. So um, let's put a plus to it to denote direction, filter out, push it out. <coughs> the other two oppose it, so I'm going to call them negative. Um, one is the regular osmotic pressure, the OP. Talked about that before. Osmotic pressure, that's the sucking pressure. That's the pressure that keeps fluids in the blood. Okay, And it's about 30. So I'm going to put negative. 30 millimeters of mercury. It opposes that 55. And then the pressure due to, due to the capsule, so they call it HPCS. HP is hydrostatic pressure, CS is the capsule. Okay. HPCS. I'll put GC here, just so you don't confuse the GC with the CS, hydrostatic pressure. This is the pressure due to the fluid inside the Bowman's capsule. And it's about a negative. Negative, they say 15. Say so just add. Or I, I should say subtract. So NFP is um, the HPGC minus the OP minus the HPCS. And um, these terms, acronyms, they change from book to book. Even on tests, you may see something slightly different. But if, if you know the concept, right, the concept due to the pressure pushing it out versus the two that oppose you, you'll get it right. So the numbers are 55 minus 30 minus 15. Which is what? 10? I think they have it on there, yeah. Is that 10 positive or negative? Positive. Positive. So that, that's a force out, a force that pushes it out of the capillary. So that is our NFP plus 10. And that pressure is enough to generate a filtration rate, a glomerular filtration rate, of 125 mils a minute. GFR, which stands for glomerular filtration rate, is 125 mils per minute. So those are the numbers in now. NFP and the filtration rate. <clears throat> Okay. One thing I didn't mention is this right here. Mean arterial pressure is fifty is ninety three. <laughs> By the time you get to the capillary here, it's fifty five. You know, in other capillary beds, it's much lower. It's like thirty five. But the pressure is much higher here. 
And that's good because you want to filter more. That's this thing's job. It's, it's a filter, so you want a higher pressure to accommodate a, higher G, a better GFR. Um, and so I asked the question, why is this number higher? Okay, so I do a comparison between glomerular capillaries and other capillary beds. Glomerular capillaries <coughs> versus systemic capillaries. We just got through saying that that HPGC is like that 55, that plus 55 millimeters of mercury. Go back and look it up. It's it's lower in other. Capillaries HP, maybe it's something like 35. It's lower. Okay. So the question becomes, why is it higher here? And um, it has to do with that arterial capillary arterial arrangement. I think I have listed at the top of the slide. But consider. So why higher? Consider. Arterial capillary arterial arrangement, or as everywhere else, it's arterial <coughs> capillary venule arrangement. A vein provides much less resistance, decrease R. But an artery, an arterial, provides much more resistance. Okay, now that kind of explains an increased pressure. Because if on the way out, there's more resistance there, you'll filter more there. Once again, if there's more resistance there, you filter more there. And so that's why, you know, that higher pressure, it's like, if, there's, if it's hard to get out, there's a higher pressure coming in, okay? And so I, I say that, you know, it's like, well, th there's a higher pressure because there's more resistance. There's also more surface area for more filtration. Increased surface area of this filtration membrane that I'm talking about. <clears throat> So like we say, we generate 180 liters a day and filter. This may be something like two liters a day. So the filtration function is much better in the glomerulus. Let's take home message. Another term to write down is high renal clearance. You're, you're clearing through, blood is circulating, and 180 liters of plasma is being filtered a day. I mean, you only have like two to three liters of plasma, and you're filtering it like 70 times a day. High renal clearance. You want to clear it out of the body if it's a toxin. And so that's an important function. Here's a picture of the glomerular surfaces. There's basically, I say, hey, there's lots of surface area, exclamation point. Okay. <coughs> well, if you have a million nephron, how many glomeruli do you have? A million. So that's a lot of surface area. So collectively, they filter at a rate of, I gave you the number, 
125 mils per minute. That rate needs to be regulated, and we need to talk about that. <clears throat> so some more numbers. The blood coming in is 775 mils a minute. Okay, 775 coming in, the afferent arterial. You filter 125 of that 175. So if you do the math, that leaves 650. That goes to the efferent arterial. Once again, 775 coming in, 125 being filtered, the rest, 650, goes out efferent arterial to the paratubular capillary or vasorecta. So when it's all said and done, you're down to one mil per minute that's excreted at the end of the uh, you know, collecting duct. So the question becomes, if you filter 125, and you excrete one, how much do you reabsorb? 124. So most of it is reabsorbed. You produce um, urine at a rate of one mil per minute. You, you reabsorb most of it. So normal GFR is about 125 mils per minute. It's directly proportional to that FP. I call it NFP or just filtration pressure. Remember we calculated it to be 10? So these, these match, right? So if you increase the pressure, you're gonna increase the filtration rate and vice versa. And uh, so the take home message here is, it can change, but you wanna keep it pretty home, at a homeostatic level. So that, that's the, the key here for a student to understand. How does the kidney maintain the 125 mils a minute if you have patients maybe that have problems with their kidneys, one way you can tell is they're not producing urine. Uh, that's not good. You put a catheter in, you keep an eye on their urine bag, make sure they're producing enough urine. Because, well, GFR, let's say, if it's too high, okay, you're filtering too fast at a much greater rate than 125 mils per minute. So if you, work, there are cells in this tube that can only work so fast. And if the rate is too high, it's not enough time to reabsorb what you need and you lose a lot of things to the urine that you want to reabsorb. If GFR is too low, and then everything is reabsorbed, including waste products you don't really want. So it's like you have to have this balance. It can't be too high or too low, neither is good. You want to keep it at 125 uh, mils per minute. So let's talk about how it's regulated. Um, Whenever you see that term auto, automatic. It's self-regulating. It's intrinsic, right? I've been using those terms a lot. It doesn't depend on innervation. It, it doesn't need nerves to do it to maintain that constant GFR. It can maintain a constant rate of 125 mils per minute, even if you change blood pressure a lot. So usually the figures that are shown to students about this is uh, If you graphed it out, you know, scientists love graphs. You put the good old blood pressure on the x-axis, BP, and you give a wide range, low, 80, super high, 200. And then put GFR rate, mils per minute, we want a homeostatic level. And what's that homeostatic level I gave you to memorize? 125. And the, the relationship I try to teach you is, if blood pressure is super high, you would expect filtration to be super high. And if blood pressure is super low, GFR should drop off. But you don't want it to. But what we see is that something like this. It stays pretty <laughs> constant. Maybe it'll go up a little bit. And maybe it'll go super high if blood pressure just gets really high. And if you get super low, it'll stay constant, but it, it, eventually it just drops off. So this is kind of the graph that's presented to students to, to illustrate that GFR is auto-regulated. Okay. 
no matter if there's a change, it can stay relatively constant. And, uh, well, there's a couple of mechanisms. One I haven't talked about before. This is automatic mechanism. I'll talk about it next. So there's two mechanisms for auto regulation. Two mechanisms for auto regulation of GFR to keep that constant. 125 mils a minute. Okay, the, the auto, the automatic one. Let's talk about it first. It's called a long fancy name. Tubulo flow dependent tubulo glomerular feedback. can control their own rate. They don't need something else telling it what to do. It all happens in-house. So this picture shows the mechanism, and they only show one nephron. So what you know so far before teaching the process is what depends on flow. Flow of what? The filtrate. Okay, and it depends on the tube feeding back to the glomerulus, which part of the tube, you, know, you would want to focus eventually. Right here, the DCT, right, that part that flows back by the vascular pole. And so if you just follow the process, let's pretend you have some imbalance. Uh, they say, okay, the imbalance is <coughs> GFR is too high. We're going a step further, so what do you want to do? Lower it. You're above 125, let's get it back down closer to 125. Okay, so what happens? If you increase the flow of the filtration at number one, you're increasing flow through the whole tube. So for number one to number two, it says you increase flow. In nephron. They say tubule, but the nephron is a tube. Now, what they don't tell you between on this figure, number one and number two, is very important. If you're increasing the flow, the cells don't have enough time to reabsorb sodium. In between here, I'm going to write not enough time for cells to <coughs> reabsorb sodium ions. So you can't reabsorb it, so it stays in the filtrate. So with this increased flow, as a result is you're going to have increased sodium in filtrate. Any questions on that? That's important. It's flowing too fast, can't take it out of the filtrate, it stays in the filtrate, right? So I put a box around that. <clears throat> Not enough time, as a result, the increased flow in the filtrate. So continue on with their steps. When you get to number three, when you go through the loop, get to the DCT right there, number three, Says flow past macula densa. Now the macula densa are specialized cells in the DCT, 
didn't tell you that yet, but so now you know. The thing about it is, there are salt sensors. There are salt sensors, the macula densa. They sense sodium. So I'll just say sodium sensors, just to keep it simple. They're going to be able to detect that there's too much salt in the filtrate. Okay. Detect increase sodium. So the, they do something about it. They say, oh, okay, well, too much sodium. So they constrict the afferent arterial. They release a substance from there to there, a very short distance, to vasoconstrict. So that's what number four says. So what they say is pericrine from macula densa to afferent arterial. Um, so I'll just say release <coughs> vasoconstrictive uh, molecule. It could be different things. Your book says it's ATP. ATP usually makes it easy to straight. And uh, yeah, so uh, next step. Number five, VC, vasoconstriction of afferent arterial. If you increase the resistance to blood flow there, well, you're going to decrease the pressure and decrease GFR. So increase resistance, capital R, therefore you... I'll just jump to the skip to it. Constrict that arterial, you're going to drop the GFR. Okay, and that, that is how you kind of like can go back and forth. So this gave you the imbalance one way. What if the imbalance was the opposite? <coughs> what if the imbalance was GFR is too low? What do you want to do? Well, you would want to increase it. So if it's too low, just think about everything in reverse. If the flow is too slow, it's the opposite of this. It's not that there's not enough time. There's too much time for cells to reabsorb sodium. So cells reabsorb a lot of it. So there would be decreased sodium in the filtrate if GFR is too low because they're reabsorbing more. Increase sodium reabsorption because there's more time. More time for sodium reabsorption. So therefore, decreased sodium in the filtrate. You get to the flow past macula densa and it detects a drop in sodium. And just assume that instead of releasing a vasoconstrictive what, what's the anatomy or physiology word that's opposite of vasoconstrict? Vasodilate. So just release something. I don't even know what it is. It could be nitric oxide increases. Or, I don't know. Vasodilate. If you vasodilate, I'll put change VC to VD. If you vasodilate the afferent arterial, you decrease the resistance to flow, you increase GFR. So that's how you self regulate intrinsically. The other way, which is an extrinsic mechanism, is we have to know the, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Let's see this picture here. Oh, so before I raise this flow chart, um, is there any uh, questions on this? So this one mechanism, this auto-regulatory thing, this is the other one, uh, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Let me uh, this.
So the second mechanism is um, mm. what's up? It's it's the renin mechanism. R A A S. So to study that in detail, let's talk about the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Apparatus implies there's more than one part. Well, there's actually three parts that books usually talk about. I just want you to know two parts, the one and the two. These cells, these specialized cells. Number one, it's pointing to the specialized cells of the DCT I just mentioned, the macula densa. So think of them as specialized cells. These are columnar cells within the DCT. That's what, literally what they are. They're dense. They're columnar. They're usually cuboidal. But these ones are columnar. And that's what they call it, these dense looking cells. They function as, like I said, salt receptors. Really, we say they're osmoreceptors. They can detect if the blood is too salty or not salty enough. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, well, those other cells are specialized cells of the tunica media, the smooth muscle cells. They're specialized smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial, number two, and they're called juxtaglomerular cells. Books now are starting to call them granular cells. I mentioned that earlier this morning. Because the granules contain renin. Now, let's remember what these cells are. They're specialized, they're special, smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterial. Why are they special? Because they have granules that contain renin. So now we know that these cells contain the renin. The question becomes is how, how are they released? Well, it depends on what's going on with the blood pressure. Is I think you may remember by now that renin, the RAS mechanism, controls blood pressure. Now, I know this figure is hard to see. Study it at home. But what it says at the top there is you have a drop in blood pressure. Okay, and as you well know, as a student of physiology, if blood pressure drops, you want to raise it, right? And so this is the mechanism that can help do that. And so, um, and, uh, It's hard to read what's in those boxes. So let me write that out. But study at home. Study this. Read the slide. Zoom in on the phone. So the homeostatic imbalance is there's systemic drop in blood pressure. I think you all can get that. I talked about this earlier. It's like, oh yeah, there's you're dehydrated, whatever, something. Without Today's lecture, we see that, well, if there's a drop in blood pressure for whatever reason, there's a drop in GFR, and there's decreased sodium in the DCT. So that's what those two say. Like that on board. Decrease GFR. OK, there's a drop in GFR. Hmm, not good. There's too much time to reabsorb sodium. So therefore, there's decreased sodium detected at the DCT. That's what it says in those two boxes. <clears throat> so both the macula densa and the JG cells, they work together to get renin released. Macula densa. And over here working in concert 
is a bear, um, JGs. What do they call? They call them juxtacle Merler cells. Now, what I should have mentioned previously before I erased it is the macula densa, they function as osmoreceptors. I did mention that. The juxtaglomerular cells, because they're part of the tunica media, or they're smooth muscle cells, they function as baroreceptors. Baroreceptors. You know what that is, right? They sense a change in pressure because where are they? They're literally cells on an arterial, on an, on an artery. So if pressure is dropping, they, they live there. They'll pick it up. They'll sense that transmural pressure drop. Okay. So anyways, what you know now is these cells have the renin. But I'm sure there's some communication with the macula densa. The net result is renin released from the JG cells, the juxtaglomerular cells. So once renin's released, boom. Well, the rest of the mechanism, study it if you need to. You do need to know it. Renin's released in the plasma then. Angiotensinogen uh, is cleaved by the renin and you convert it into angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 2 comes about when ACE cleaves it, right, you know that whole process. And then angiotensin 2, as you may remember, it facilitates aldosterone release from the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex, right, it says that right there. And that will facilitate uh, sodium uptake from DCT and water follows to increase blood pressure, or there's a direct effect <laughs> on angiotensin 2 to constrict blood vessels. That was previously taught. Boom, boom. I have it all listed there. Well, anyways, you still need to know. Uh, there is no written part of lecture exam 7, so it'll be a multiple choice question. So does that make you happy? There's no written part? Okay. It makes me happy. I don't have to grade it, but it is what it is. <laughs> no written part. Um, just to tell you that the lecture exam seven, you usually get 50 questions, right? But because there's no written part, I extend it. So maybe there'll be something like 60 to 75 multiple choice questions. I'm not done writing the test yet, but it'll be within that range. So the test will be worth something like 120 to 150 points, depending on how long you make it. So just a heads up. Okay. That's not so bad. You don't have to groan about that. <clears throat> All right. Well, anyways, I guess I give you plenty to groan about. We'll just keep going until we're done. If you look at this picture, let's make sense of all the structures we've talked about. This is the renal corpuscle. Okay. Um, is that afferent or efferent? What do you think? Afferent. Therefore, efferent. Now, whenever they cut it open, they're doing it for a reason. They're trying to show you those special cells. Juxtacle glomerular cells. Okay. Now this is supposed to be the DCT. But right here, don't call it that. The special ones are called macula densa. They show you red glomerular capillaries. If I tag this, don't call it glomerulus. Why is it purple? It's going for that visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. What if I point to that and I say identify cell, potocyte. So that's the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. What layer is that? Parietal. Very good. You can call that PCT or tubular pole. What if I say identify pole? Vascular. Same picture. It's labeled here. Okay. Remember, after and efferent. Remember. They say juxtaglomerular apparatus, but you should know DCT macula densa versus the juxtaglomerular cells. Okay. Uh, here's a close-up picture. There's the DCT, but I would always use this to test you on macula densa. Let's call that 
juxtacle Mailer cells. But if I tag it down there, I'm not going for those cells. I'm going for just afferent arterial, efferent arterial, glomerulus. Uh, this is um, the podocyte cell nucleus. I might even point to there. What do you think I'm going for there? Filtration slit. A lot of things I can point to. <clears throat> this one's labeled. Uh, I don't like how they call it DCT. What would I want you to put? Select Densa. macula densa. Okay. Um, okay. Now, if you look at these spindle-shaped cells, those are regular smooth muscle cells. And we got them here too. But the ones that are shaped like a hexagon, <clears throat> those are the special ones called the juxtaglomerular cells. And they have the red in. Glomerular capillary, but if it's gray, it's like the layer over it. It's like the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. And you can see the colorful white-ish podocytes with the blue nucleus. And the little sticks, you would call podocytes. Okay. Um, they try to point. I didn't make this, by the way. Podocytes. That, podocytes. Yeah. Um, podocyte is the name of the cell. If I point to the stick, call it foot process. Okay. So if I point to blue nucleus, just go for podocyte. Okay. If I point to stick, foot process. Uh, you know, this is a good place to stop. Pick it up here next time. Uh, class dismissed. I'll see you Friday if you signed up for the cadaver presentation. If you didn't sign up, I'll assume you took the alternative assignment, and I'll see you Monday.